with our next presentation here at the NVIDIA GPU Technology booth sponsored by HP. I am very pleased to introduce James Hack from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, who is going to, hear, who's going to be here today and talk a little more science with us. Okay. Jim? Thank you very much. Um, I want to acknowledge at the outset my uh, colleagues who contributed some of the material in this. Uh, folks have seen uh, some talks already from RNL, like Jack Wells' talk, but got into some of the details. I want to focus on, uh, and, and in fact, it was asked to focus on some of the applications that are driving us uh, forward with regard to high performance computing. And again, thanks to my, my colleagues, uh, Buddy Bland, Bronson Messer, uh, Jim Rogers, and Jack Wells. So uh, I guess I pointed at this. Is there a way to advance? Is there a reason why I won't advance? I can use the mouse to do it from there. Or just use this. Okay. So just very quickly, um, it, when you start looking at the DOE's uh, strategic priorities um, uh, in the areas of innovation, energy, security, and, and so on, look at all the, the um, uh, top tier uh, activities. In terms of dealing with them in the next um, few decades, we're not going to be dealing with incremental changes to any existing technology, be it for energy technologies that are needed in terms of new materials, uh, adaptation strategies, for example, with regard to environmental change or the tools that are going to allow us to ex uh, explore the future in a predictive sense. And that's kind of the theme of this is that uh, part of our problem is we're seeing the first stage of disruptive technology with uh, hybrid architectures. And we've got to convince the uh, applications community that there's real value add there. And that's what I want to talk about with regard to the climate problem. For those of you who um, were asleep a year or so ago, there was this storm that hit uh, the East Coast, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, um, and uh, this is a great picture that was on the cover of New York Magazine. And in it, you can see the, whoops, I'm sorry, the, the lower part of Manhattan basically blacked out. And it was blacked out for, for a very long period of time. So here's uh, an environmental in, uh, 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 in activity, an environmental event that had profound impact on a lot of people. And uh, what I want to get at is that this actually, this sort of thing is predictable. And uh, so I want to talk about a little bit uh, the predictability issues in the environment, both on deterministic timescales as well as climate timescales. So I, I think of it as a virtualization challenge. You're trying to take uh, this system that we, we think we understand, we understand pretty well, and, and turn it into a virtual uh, laboratory experiment. And this particular event is a great example of this virtualization challenge. You have this thing that's going to happen some point in the future, and how far out can you, uh, can you make that prediction? So I think this is one of the more recent examples of success. There are actually many others. If, you, if people look hard enough, they kind of forget about these things most of the time. And I go back to um, uh, this uh, thing that appeared in the cap by the Capital Weather Gang in the Washington Post. This is on the 21st of October in which they said, there's a big storm coming next week, October 29th. This is eight days in advance. Uh, the numerical models that they were referring to was the European Center Global Model, and it showed actually an eight-day forecast where this storm came up the coast and then took this turn to the left that no synoptic meteorologist would predict. This is totally out of character. And then a few days later when they, and the, uh, uh, the U.S. models caught up, you had the same sort of thing. The models are actually making a prediction many, many days in advance, giving the kind of warning that, um, uh, that you know, is required to prepare for uh, something like this, like an extreme event of this kind. So what this demonstrated was that from a simulation perspective, you're already starting to master the time scales um, on, the, on deterministic time scales, which are ordered two weeks. The, the simulation tools, the predictive tools we have are really kind of are at a point where they're uh, depending on the nature of the flow field, can do a very good job of predicting what's going to happen. Um, more importantly, it illustrates the, uh, the scale problem, this, the challenge with scale, in the sense that these models, which, you know, 
are are more probably marginally re resolving. Whoops, I'm sorry. I want to do the um, probably marginally resolving the the event itself are the things that are being used to drive other models. That, for example, uh, the folks who are charged with infrastructure and protecting our infrastructure are actually running. So, for example, in this case, in the middle. Uh, chart. These are people in uh, models being run in New York City to look at the tidal um, actions f for raising sea level and seeing that they knew actually long in advance that they were in deep trouble, that there was water that was going to come in over the flood, flood walls. They knew where it was going to happen, and they knew uh, that this is the sort of thing that was going to put things like subways and so on out of, out of work. So uh, you can think about this as a scale thing. You can resolving these things, but you need to feed these other tools that actually help predict um, um, uh, those charged with protecting uh, infrastructure, even investing in new infrastructure with uh, the boundary conditions they need to make good decisions, actionable decisions. So this is a, um, a Nate Silver quote, which I love, in the sense that he s it says, I can't believe that meteorologists use math and science to predict this storm. I don't know what people think um, uh, is done in this field, but this is actually a very mature uh, mathematical problem. In fact, it's one of the hardest problems. I, I, you know, even in my current role, I can imagine that we're trying to solve. And more importantly, the fact that it was uh, recognized, you know, people start to recognize that there is predictive science here. There, the, these quotes from politi political people were saying there's a series of extreme weather incidents. It's not a political statement. It's a factual statement. And things like the governor of New York saying, I had said to the president the other day, we have a 100-year flood every two years. That's a profound appreciation of what the real problem is. The return period is not 100 years anymore. It's actually uh, more frequent. And the question is, why? What's going on? Well, something's going on. What you believe is, uh, is forcing it is almost irrelevant because it's happening. If uh, you believe what I believe, we're doing a grand experiment right now that uh, is happening in real time. And if we really want to understand what happens, we need to really develop predictive capabilities that allow um, us to, uh, to uh, anticipate what's happening and, and take the right kind of mitigation and adaptation ste steps. And when I say, you know, something's up, all you have to do is look at things like, for the first time in recorded history, Northwest Passage opening in 2007. And the fact that Arctic sea ice has fallen by more than 50% over the last, um, since 1950. These are facts. We don't argue with, you can't argue with the facts. So what is it? What's happening? And what we're trying to do is to build tools to, uh, to start answering uh, those questions. Examples of some of the consequences questions, if it's, you know, from a climate change perspective, uh, they, they touch virtually everything that matters to uh, uh, everyday people. Water resource management agriculture and food security, human health, uh, the terrestrial ecosystem in terms of things that will uh, be able to survive changes in, um, in uh, changes in water availability and so on, coastal zone management, and then human engineered systems. So if you want to make an investment in something that's um, uh, uh, large like a nuclear power plant or something has to stand up for 50 years or so, you'd like to know what kind of an environment is this thing going to be uh, uh, surviving in down the line? So um, if you look at the, the uh, state of this science, computing is paced uh, uh, progress. There's no question that our scientific understanding is also pacing progress, but being able to uh, trans translate that understanding in the form of a, a, a model, a quantitative model, has basically as Computing technologies have improved. Uh, the, comp the complexity and the resolution of uh, our modeling frameworks have improved. We're at a point now at the Pettis scale where we're able to deal with atm the atmospheric and ocean eddy motion field. We have some reduced forms of microphysical, chemical, and biogeochemical processes that are incorporated in those models, but there's more to do, and one wants to understand those other processes in more detail because they do, in fact, have uh, important feedbacks uh, in the system on longer time scales. Not deterministic time scales for weather, but on climate time scales. So you can think of this as the fidelity of your simulation on this axis, where we're going to go up through axis scale. Another way to think about this is um, uh, in, in this sort of form, in the sense that this is a multi-scale problem, it's a multi-physics problem, and it's, it, and it's the turbulent phase change of water that's driving the system. And it happens at all scales. 
And so you're going from uh, turbulence to uh, which is, you know, you could characterize two-dimensional turbulence in the form of uh, cyclones and so on, down to things that are more on the scales of diffusion. And the kinds of computing you need to be able to resolve those processes is on this axis, and you can see. We're not going to run out of room when we hit exascale capability. There's more to do. But these are the sort of phenomena that you're able to do as you start improving or be able to treat explicitly in the climate context as you uh, increase the uh, performance of um, and capabilities of your computing systems. The kinds of progress, um, what, what is it that this community is worried about the most? Uh, time to solution dominates everything. So one of the more recent interesting um, um, uh, things that have appeared in the literature in nature, for example, last year had to do with trying to explain data. The old data, the paleoclimate data from the last um, a, a glacial cycle that was raising the question of whether or not CO2 led the warming or CO2 lagged the warming. And with a numerical model, they, uh, these scientists were able to demonstrate that in fact CO2 did in fact lead um, uh, the warming and it had to do with an asymmetric hemispheric response to the warming. But the problem here is you have to simulate 20,000 years many millennia in order to get that answer to the question. If you want to do it with some real rigor, you want to do several realizations in an ensemble to, to knock down the, uh, the statistics. In this case, the signal is so strong, uh, you can do it with a single realization. This is sort of an example of pre-petascale uh, capabilities. And where petascale is taking us now is the ability to uh, include motion scales in both the atmosphere and the ocean that allow us to really now to begin exploring uh, issues related to regional um, climate. You know, what, what are the things that are, mo are modulating and changing regional climate? Uh, what, um, uh, what are, what's fueling extreme events? What's fueling having a tor tornado outbreak that's more like May than, uh, than it should be in, uh, when it's happening in November? So the problem is not as easy as just let's turn up the, the uh, resolution dial. And this is just a couple of slides to illustrate that phenomena like uh, looking at things that are important in other parts of the world like the, um, the Asian um, Indian monsoon, that at low resolution models, they weren't, they just not capable of capturing the onset of the monsoon. The high resolution model can ca capture the onset of the monsoon better, but it's not just overwhelmingly uh, 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 you know, better in the sense that there's a, a, some bias is being removed, but not entirely. Uh, another example is looking at extreme events where uh, looking at the, uh, the tail, basically, of um, the distribution of precipitation in the models, where your preliminary result is uh, that there's an increase in variance in precipitation, let's say, in a, in, in a, in a higher resolution model that's more, more like what we observe, but the problem is it's not jumping out at you. What it says is that as we increase the res the, uh, the, uh, our ability to resolve the, um, the motion field, the way in which we treat the physics has to be revisited. So that's the science that still has to be done in order to um, move the field forward. So I like to think about this as we move toward exascale capabilities from the science frontier. There, it comes in two forms. There's an understanding that has to come from a better representation of certain processes we know we're not doing a good job at. But there are also predictive science outcomes that are you could probably count on. And that's being able to do a much better job with characterizing variability on, on regional scales to help deal with things related to the water cycle, water availability, the food security questions that we talked about, and also characterize the changes, any changes, even uh, normal changes in frequency and intensity of extreme events. Rate of sea level rise, very important for coastal communities. Potential for abrupt change, those are those surprises, the um, low probability, high impact events. And then uh, in the longer term, recognizing that the way we respond to these challenges does in fact uh, influence, it creates an additional forcing on the system. If we look at what um, uh, th this kinds of capabilities um, exascale will also enable and also drive, and this comes out of an NRC report that was recently um, uh, produced, and that, and that with these kinds of capabilities, it gives the scientific community a chance to do comprehensive, rigorous, 
uncertainty quantification of the of the, the simulations. In other words, you're going to bound. You kind of have some prob probability of uh, how right or wrong you know the answer may be. And this is gets at trying to understand where the uh, structural uncertainty and parametric uncertainty is in in the models. And then it's going to drive a need for improved validation frameworks because we're dealing with signals that are very, very small, almost unobservable. And uh, so a better validation frameworks that help us better, you know, produce better models when we have uh, structural uncertainty problems. And then evolution to a common software infrastructure. And this is coming out of the recognition that we're moving toward a more, dis we're going to be moving into a period where we're going to be rapidly evolving architectures. and. Um, and programming environments. And so the need to be nimble and not just do your, roll your own thing, uh, the community might benefit greatly by making that kind of an evolution. So I want to now jump just really quickly to ORNL as, as the leadership computing facility. We have a mission to, to uh, field uh, the most powerful uh, machines available out in the uh, open science world, build that infrastructure, uh, identify through user programs that Jack talked about, like Insight and ALCC, some very time-sensitive, important problems and partner with those uh, uh, teams on the outside to deliver uh, against the science. If you look at the, in what's happened since the leadership facility was first uh, created, there's a thousand-fold increase in delivery in terms of what we're delivering in the way of computational performance in that period of time, from 2005 through 2009. And 2009 corresponds to the installation of the Jaguar system, um, uh, computer system. This is the Cray XT5. Uh, that was uh, put into production in 2009 and that for a short time was sitting at the top of the top 500 list. I want to make one point with this slide. I understand they'll be around, but it's that we, we do focus on that big machine in the back, you know, in terms of trying to provide more and more capability, but we have, it, have to do it in a balanced way where this next, next instantiation of the computing uh, uh, environment includes not just the new machine, which I'm going to talk about in a second, but data storage systems, 40 petabytes of, of uh, rotating disk with a terabyte per second um, a bandwidth to an on and off the file system, new data analytics and visualization capabilities, as well as uh, networking capabilities that give us um, uh, uh, un unmatched ability to be connected. So as Jack Wells showed earlier, um, where uh, the, the new Titan system has a peak performance about, of 27 petaflops. Um, the important message here, these are all the little the details, but the important message is this system occupies the same space and approximately the same power envelope and yet provides the potential for 10 times the, uh, the, the uh, um, work that can be done in a unit of time because of, of u utilizing uh, a, uh, a hybrid ar architecture. And why, why are we doing that? Why are we making that jump, okay, to uh, this hybrid architecture that includes an NVIDIA accelerator as well as an, uh, an AMD x86 CPU? We're, we, we take a look at where we're going with regard to exascale systems. We're dealing with uh, radically different uh, problem in the way of managing the parallelism that's going to be, have to be done in a hierarchical way. It's going to have to be done in a, a more deliberate way. Where we have to look at systems that are going to be able to um, um, deal with the power problem um, that everyone's well aware of. And then also realize that from a pr perspective of, for example, memory uh, bandwidth, memory size, and so on, none of these ratios that we've lived with for very long have, uh, are projected to be maintained, at least not as aggressively as you can improve other aspects of the system. So. The node inside the um, uh, XK7 is uh, an AMD 16-core Opteron uh, CPU coupled with an NVIDIA processor. And when I show some numbers here at the end, I want it to be clear that you can, in theory, what we're going to do apples to apples, compare performance on, of, that, um, uh, of this kind of a node and in the system context where the, with a node that actually has two AMD uh, x86 processors in it, okay? And there are a couple of messages here. And I like going back to the fact that, you know, you, when I was uh, a lot younger, Jack Walton was making the case when we were moving from vector to uh, massively parallel that there are these uh, logistical uh, curves and we're, we're about to jump off the, that we are jumped, we have jumped off this massively parallel era and we're going into this multi-core era. So it's time to sort of get on the bus or get left behind. 
Um, our Center for Accelerated Application Readiness was set up when we started putting this machine together, the project together. The idea was to uh, identify a set of application codes and set up, uh, uh, create a team that uh, engaged tools developers, the applications community, uh, architecture experts, and so on to help uh, identify where uh, we could make investments in order to migrate codes in a performance portable way uh, to the new architecture. The application space that we uh, uh, identified at that time was these were uh, heavy users of the machine in material science, climate change, uh, um, uh, molecular dynamics, astrophysics, mostly here because we wanted to look at AMR techniques. Uh, that was the major um, driver here, combustion, and then nuclear energy, nuclear engineering. The overall plan was uh, let's put these teams together. Um, uh, we, we wanted to also target some early signs that could be done once this process was done, complete we're, we're in terms of migrating um, the codes, and we wanted the codes to be ready on day one when the machine was ready for, for um, uh, operation. And as the slide indicates, uh, it did, we, there's no recipe. The recipe really comes from investing in understanding what your application does, how it works, and many different types of application methods were being explored in order to make this happen. How does it work? Well, Jack showed an activity, for example, in earlier the LAMPS activity in molecular dynamics code that when we compare the performance of uh, the high, the, um, this code on a, um, an XE6, which is a node comprised of two X86s versus um, an X86 and the uh, Kepler um, accelerator, you have a factor of 7.4. And in, in fact, most of all of these problems, like for example, S3D is a very tough problem. It's a multi-scale, multi-physics problem, has a lot of similarities to climate. Climate is in the same ballpark, about a factor of 2x over um, the traditional architectures. But mostly, a very, very good uh, return on investment. We look at the rest, our, our, our colleagues out in the communities who are also working on uh, accelerator uh, codes, we see, again, large numbers, factors of two, at least, uh, uh, in terms of uh, performance improvements, which this opens the door to doing new science, doing it sooner than, uh, than you might have been able to do it otherwise. So, lessons learned. Exposing unrealized parallelism, identifying the opportunities is often straightforward. Exploiting them is pretty hard work. It, it can be hard work. The developers, though, can very quickly learn once you understand what your space is that you're operating in. And uh, exploiting directives-based approaches do offer a path to performance portability because our, our applications people work everywhere. They don't just work on our environment. It took about one to two person years to port each code to Titan. Um, this is an important point. This pays off for other systems. We take these ported codes and put them back on an x86 system and run them against their original version, and they run one and a half, two times faster. So the numbers I'm giving you are multipliers on that one and a half to two times faster. So even a factor of two with an accelerated code on, uh, on a hybrid node or a hybrid system is more like a factor of four, which is uh, significant. Um, another important point is that this doesn't the application community is, is just holding on to lots of legacy codes. And, the sponsors of these computationally intensive applications need to understand that there's going to be a cost and they have to be willing to, to pay for it. So to summarize, um, some of the things that we've seen, you know, that partnering, you know, in this venture has really proven to, uh, to be of great value in navigating uh, this first stage of uh, architectural transition. This was a, these are very highly integrated, highly invo uh, engaged uh, teams that worked together. Um, the numbers I showed you, I think, you know, demonstrate the advantages of hybrid architectures, and we, we hope to see much more of this. We're in the process of codifying the, the, what we've done in the form of best practices so that we can reach out to more of the user community in terms of what, what do you have to do in order to um, uh, uh, realize these improvements. Um, investments and collaborations with critical technology providers. This, you can, I, I'm putting down a couple of examples that were important to us for tools, compilers, and so on. But this is also true with the hardware community as we look forward. We, this, another term for this is co-design, that we actually um, 
each other. We know what uh, the nature of our problem is so that we can uh, make the, uh, the appropriate uh, choices when uh, one has to balance the, um, uh, you know, balance out um, investment choices. And I think um, we're seeing the early, if you want to call it first benefit outcome from the people who are making this investment in the sense that uh, uh, there are going to be people who can do materials work or climate work with some of these codes that we've moved already that others uh, won't be able to do. It's, it, it does have a transformational uh, impact on, on the type of science. Uh, the applications by themselves are more fully exploiting uh, Titan's capability by taking, making it a serious part of their uh, development um, effort. and. Um, and as I said, again, in the investments in refactoring these applications create new science opportunities, and we're seeing it already in climate and materials and combustion and other areas. So I'll stop there. So Thank, Thank you, you very you much, Jim. We have time for one question here in the theater. Okay. Hi, Ken. Hi, Jim. <laughs> uh, regarding the scale of the storms and the hurricane the typhoon yes and we had a big one in japan and also the philippines suffered from it yes so what's going on is it because of the sea surface temperature rise or? i think the the issue right now from a science perspective is can you attribute events to um uh to some other forcing and i think it's a hard, very hard problem to do you need more you're looking at the statistical behavior of the system and are these things happening more frequently? Are they happening? Are they more intense? Um, I think you talk with a lot of you know ordinary people. You think about the, these um, politicians in New York. I mean, they're watching the consequences of major storms that are wreaking havoc on infrastructure, saying it's happening every year. You know, we how do we continue to afford this? You know, they're saying maybe there's something going on. These big tornado outbreaks that have happened uh, recently. You know the. Um, and the tropics and the problem is that if you were looking at atlantic hurricanes the 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 uh, planetary dynamics that affects which basin you're going to get a lot of storms in is a probably a, that mode of variability is a stronger one than the modes being forced by any sort of radiative forcing on the planet so th this year was the pacific's year we'll see what happens next year if you know in the atlantic but yeah i i think it's um uh, I don't think the press is overstating. These are things that have not been observed before in terms of their intensity. Yeah. All right. Well, thank okay. you again, Jim, for, for joining us. And okay. everybody, you should stay because Jim mentioned um, co-design and HPC in the co-design space. And our next speaker is your colleague, Jeff Vetter, who's going to speak just to that. So um, hang on. He'll be right up.